of the obscure unsolved mysteries, Iceberg is an iceberg that covers unexplained phenomena, conspiracy theories, deaths and disappearances, and other bizarre mysteries. In this video, we'll be diving deeper into the iceberg, covering what we think are the most interesting entries from the second to the fourth levels of the iceberg. So let's get into it. Kathy Hobbs' Premonition Ever since she was a child, Kathy Hobbs had experienced several premonitions about dying at an early age. When she turned 8 years old, the premonitions became more specific. Kathy became convinced that she wouldn't make it past 16 years old. As her 16th birthday approached, Kathy's worries and fears only increased. She would spend all of her time in her home afraid to go outside. When she woke up on her 16th birthday, Kathy gained a newfound love of life. All of her previous fears and anxieties disappeared. She had managed to survive her 16th birthday. Kathy became more outgoing and happier. All that came to an unfortunate end on the evening of July 23, 1987. Kathy went out to buy a new book from a local supermarket at 11 p.m., giving her mother a kiss on the way out. The supermarket was only a block away, and Kathy's friends were usually present at the apartment pool nearby. So her mother had nothing to worry about and went to sleep shortly after. Kathy's mother suddenly woke up at 3 a.m., having had a strange dream. She claimed that she felt that she had been hit on the head before a very peaceful feeling overcame her, and she thought, it's all over now, before going back to sleep. Kathy's mom then woke up the next day to find her daughter's bed still empty. She contacted the police straight away and a search was launched alongside an extensive media campaign covering her disappearance. Nine days after Kathy's disappearance, Hiker Rick Pakol was searching for rock crystals out in the desert when he came across her body. Two rocks at the scene were covered with her blood. The autopsy concluded that she had died from multiple blows to the head. After her death, Kathy's parents discovered several letters in her room addressed to each member of her family. They had been written a month before her 16th birthday. The letters were written in event of her death and told the parents not to dwell on her death and keep on living happily but to also keep her memory alive. A serial killer by the name of Michael Lee Lockhart was arrested later on in relation to another murder, but was believed to be the perpetrator of Kathy's murder. He was put on trial, convicted, and subsequently executed. Frederick Pierre Borden Frederick Pierre Borden, nicknamed the Chameleon, is a French serial imposter who claims to have taken over 500 false identities throughout his life. As a 21-year-old man in 1997, Borden assumed the identity of missing teenager Nicholas Barclay. Nicholas had disappeared on the 13th of June 1994, after being last seen playing basketball with his friends in San Antonio, Texas. On 1997, Borden managed to convince Barclay's mother and sister on the phone that he was the missing teen. After calling the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children beforehand to gather details about Nicholas Barclay, he was then flown from France to the U.S. Despite Borden having brown eyes while the missing Barclay had blue eyes, and Borden having a French accent, he managed to convince Barclay's parents that he had skimmed from a child prostitution ring that had altered his eye color and changed his accent. Borden managed to live with the family for five months, until a private investigator grew suspicious and compared a photo of Barclay's ears to those of Nicholas. He found out that they did not match. Several other suspicions were also raised, before eventually, DNA samples and fingerprints were then taken from Borden and confirmed his true identity. He was then imprisoned for six years. When he came out of prison though, after being deported back to France, Borden did not stop his impersonations. Borden even went as far as assuming the identity of a 15-year-old Spanish orphan when he himself was 31 years old. By dressing as a teenager, changing his walk, removing all facial hair using hair removal creams, and using a cap to cover his receding hairline. He was eventually caught and outed, before being imprisoned again for using a previous false identity. Giant Finger In 1988, Swiss club owner Gregor Spori traveled to Egypt with the goal of learning more about the supernatural side of ancient Egyptian history. In his travels, he came across a farmer by the name of Naguib from a long line of grave robbers. Naguib claimed that he could show him something that would change his view of history in general. After giving him $300, Naguib produced an oblong package wrapped in leather. Unwrapping it, Spori was surprised to see a mummified giant finger, which was at least 13.8 inches long and 2.3 inches thick. Judging by the size of the finger, its owner must have been 16 to 19 feet tall. 
The finger was leathery, with a bone protruding from the end, and fungus and evidence of mice gnawing on it in several places. Naguib claimed that the finger has been passed on through his family for 150 years and produced a leather folder containing certificates of authenticity. He also produced an alleged x-ray of the finger, which had been taken when his now deceased son had taken the finger to a large hospital in Cairo to verify its authenticity. He claimed that the finger was authentic. Despite Spori's request, Naguib refused to sell him the finger, claiming that it was a very important part of his family's heritage and only allowed Spori to take a few pictures of the finger. When Sporia later showed the finger to scientists, they denied the authenticity of the relic, claiming that without any physical proof, it was most likely a fake. Despite going back to Egypt years later, Spori was unable to find the man who had shown him the finger. While the finger was most likely a fake, a theory claims that the finger could have been authentic, but could have belonged to someone suffering from macrodystrophia, a disease which causes abnormal growth of fingers in relation to the body. Though this is disputed by the fact that the finger is mostly symmetrical, unlike cases of macrodystrophia. Without any further proof or direct analysis of the relic itself, its authenticity could not be proven. The Little Red Man of Paris The Little Red Man of Paris is an urban legend concerning Napoleon Bonaparte. It is said that during Napoleon's military campaign in Egypt, he was approached by the spirit of the Little Red Man who became his trusted advisor until Napoleon's ill-fated Russian campaign in 1812. The Little Red Man abandoned Napoleon then, after advising him against the invasion, advice which Napoleon did not heed and subsequently caused him to lose the battle, which led to his downfall. The Little Red Man has also been linked to Delirious Palace in Paris, appearing and serving as an advisor to French royalty since 1542, until the palace burned down in May 1871, after which he disappeared never to be seen or heard from again. Consciousness lasts two minutes after clinical death. Professor Sam Parnia has been researching near-death experiences for years. Parnia has interviewed countless people who have gone through near-death experiences, along with monitoring their brain waves and brain oxygen levels in a series of experiments. According to him, a new undiscovered level or form of consciousness might exist in the period between cessation of blood and oxygen delivery in the brain until actual cellular brain death. Parnia asserts that death is not a solid point in time, but rather a reversible process that occurs gradually after cardiac arrest. Parnia is particularly interested in the similarity of near-death experiences across several cultures and age groups, with almost all people who reported near-death experiences reporting the same experiences, such as out-of-body experiences, a tunnel of light, and encountering a being of infinite love and compassion. Parnia has run several experiments to prove that these experiences might have been objective instead of a subjective hallucination caused by a dying brain. In one such study, Parnia placed randomly generated pictures on the shelves of hospital rooms so that they could only be seen from the ceiling. His goal was to confirm whether someone experiencing an out-of-body experience is able to accurately describe the photos on the shelf, thus proving that at the very least, out-of-body experiences during near-death are objective and pretty much real experiences. Unfortunately, his experiment did not generate any consistent results, with much of the people taking part either not having near-death experiences in the first place, or the ones experiencing them not remembering them. Other volunteers even had out-of-body experiences in different rooms than the ones set up for the experiment. Dublin, Wisconsin Dovland, Wisconsin was allegedly a small town in Wisconsin that disappeared in the 1980s or 90s. No evidence of its existence remains, save for several souvenirs such as mugs and t-shirts bearing the town's name, along with several individuals remembering living or passing through there. No records exist of the town, not on any maps old or new, or not on any public records. Supposedly the town housed military families, and several theories are linked to its disappearance. The theories range from a military experiment gone wrong, to flooding due to damming, or people leaving simply due to a failing economy. Other supernatural explanations are put forward such as the town simply disappearing one night into thin air, along with all its residents. Despite all of that, almost not a single shred of believable evidence exists for the presence of a town called Dovland in Wisconsin. Lion Man Encounters this story was posted on an old forum about an obscure phenomenon known as bedroom animals. The story takes place in Dublin, Ireland between 1981 and 1985. 
OP claims that as a kid, he had a habit of crawling to his parents' bedroom in the middle of the night, up until the age of four, at which point his dad had had enough and promised to let OP keep the lights on as long as he slept in his own bed. While in bed, OP would drift in and out of sleep. In the times he was awake, he would stare at the curtain's design, following it with his eyes. Then it happened. A seven-foot-tall creature suddenly appeared from behind the curtain. The creature was covered in a sandy-colored fur, with a lion's head attached to really long legs, as if it lacked a torso. The creature stared at Opie for a few seconds and started approaching his bed before vanishing into thin air. Opie was certain that he wasn't asleep throughout the whole thing and that he felt no fear. A couple of years later, a similar thing happened. The wood from the wardrobe in Opie's bedroom split open. A glowing white hippo-like head appeared, emitting a strange squeaking sound as it swung its head back and forth. Opie swears he heard a sound of laughter from the opposite side of the room before the creature disappeared back into the wardrobe as if nothing had happened, once again feeling no fear. OP once again claims he was certain he wasn't dreaming, as there's a big difference between the atmosphere of dreams and reality. Over the years, OP experienced similar visitations from different animals, until the final incident which occurred when he was seven. While alone in bed, OP felt a strange presence watching him as he slept. So while under the covers, he turned to face the wall, where a deep growling sound came from behind him, terrifying him. OP claims this was the last incident, and that whether a coincidence or not, the incident stopped when his old wardrobe was removed from his room. The phenomenon seems to have happened to other people where they call it the bedroom animals phenomenon. Autoscopy Autoscopy is the experience in which a person perceives their surrounding environment from a different perspective, from a position outside of their own body. Experiences involving autoscopy are regarded as hallucinations according to neurological research. However, it's unknown what causes them. Other disorders related to this are heotoscopy and polyapic heotoscopy. Heotoscopy is when a person hallucinates seeing their own body at a distance and can occur as a symptom of schizophrenia and epilepsy. It could also explain cases of people seeing their doppelgangers or lookalikes. Polyopic heotoscopy refers to cases involving seeing more than one double. One such case occurred in 2006, in which according to neuroscientist Peter Brugger and his colleagues, a man reported experiencing five doubles of himself, which resulted from a tumor in his brain. To Catch a P Craigslist Warner To Catch a Predator was an American reality TV series hosted by Chris Hansen. In the series, Predators would be lured using decoys posing as minors. The decoys would chat with the Predators with the intent of luring them out to meet. During the crew's operation in Long Beach, Someone posted to Craigslist, advising that Dateline was in the area, filming another To Catch a Predator episode. It remains a mystery as to how this information got out, whether someone from the crew let it slip outside to someone they knew, or whether there was a Predator that recognized the sign during a chat with the decoy and so wanted to warn others like him. Ancient Acoustic Levitation A lot of ancient civilizations used massive stones to construct their monuments, like the pyramids and Stonehenge. Considering how enormous the building blocks were, and how ancient civilizations stacked the technology to move these stones, could there have been another method of lifting these stones? Taking the Great Pyramids of Egypt as an example, no one knows for sure how exactly they were built. It was estimated that it took a workforce of 4,000 to 5,000 men 20 years to build the pyramids, using pulleys, ropes, ramps, and brute force. A passage written by 10th century Arab historian Al Masudi could give a theory on how the pyramids were built. Al Masudi wrote that a magic papyrus was placed under the stone to be moved. The stone was then struck with a metal rod causing it to levitate, moving along a stone paved path fenced on either side by metal poles. The stones would travel along that path for 50 meters before settling to the ground, repeating the process over until the stones were placed where the builders wanted them. There are other ancient structures made up of enormous blocks that are precisely constructed. However, with little to no record of how these structures were constructed. Perhaps the method mentioned by Al Masudi, a method of acoustic levitation, was used by ancient civilizations, which has been lost to time. Mauna Sahidake SOS On the 24th of July 1989, a helicopter was searching for some missing hikers from Tokyo, near Mount Sahidake in Hokkaido. The helicopter pilots noticed a giant SOS sign made from logs on the ground approximately 2.5 miles away from the summit of Isayadake. Each letter was 16 feet long and 10 feet wide. The rescue team proceeded to recover the hikers, 
about two miles north of the sign, and got them to the hospital. When the hikers were asked about the SOS sign, they said they had nothing to do with it. Another search revealed a skeleton in a backpack containing an ID belonging to Kenji Iwamura, who had been missing since 1984, along with two cameras, a notebook, and a tape recorder where Iwamura cried for help. It is still unknown who was responsible for creating the sign. Optogram In the late 1800s, there was a popular scientific belief that the last image seen by a dying person or animal was recorded on the retina. An image developed from a dead retina is called an optogram. Physiologist Wilhelm Kuhn was able to obtain an optogram from a rabbit. The optogram successfully showed the last thing the rabbit saw, which was the window it was facing. However, when Kuhn tried to do the same with humans, he was unsuccessful. John Lawson Mannequin House The John Lawson House is a house located in New Hamburg, New York. What makes this house strange is that it's inhabited by a group of mysterious life-sized mannequins. What's even stranger is that on occasion the mannequins have been seen to switch locations. They have also been known to change clothing, wearing different wigs and holding different props. There doesn't seem to be anyone other than the mannequins inhabiting the house, so how could these things have happened? It's possible that this could be someone playing a harmless prank, but no one has ever seen anyone move the mannequins. Another explanation could be the result of two events. The first was on the 6th of February 1871, when a freight train derailed striking an oncoming passenger express train. Since the trains were also carrying oil, it resulted in a huge fire causing 22 fatalities. This happened around 200 feet from the John Lawson house. The second event happened in 1877, where a huge fire engulfed seven buildings near the John Lawson house. Many people believe that the mannequins may have been possessed by the spirits of those who have lost their lives in the two events. Jetpack Man, Kazakhstan, 1936 This entry refers to a story told by a 15-year-old girl by the name of E. E. Lozniya living in Kazakhstan. According to her, she was walking one winter morning in 1936 when she encountered a strange sight. A figure flying in the sky dressed in black, with a helmet obscuring his face, and an oval-shaped backpack where a rumbling sound emanated from. Though the girl kept staring at the flying man transfixed by the sight. Curiosity quickly turned to fear though, when she realized that the man suddenly changed directions and was headed towards her. The girl started running, but when she looked up again moments later, the man was nowhere to be found. Several theories exist for this event, the first being a time slip, where a man testing a jetpack in recent times slipped through a rip in time space and ended up in 1936 Kazakhstan before returning to his native time once again. Another theory is that an extraterrestrial with advanced technology or military testing of secret technology decades before it was made public. The story itself is most likely a hoax, or the girl could have made the story up or had an overactive imagination. Caveman Bullet Holes Almost a century ago, a skull belonging to a prehistoric humanoid species was found in Kabwe, Zambia dated 125,000 to 300,000 years. The skull had a small circular hole on the back in the cranium, along with a shattered parietal bone on the opposite side. While originally it was theorized that this small, almost perfectly round exit wound in the skull could have been caused by a spear or arrow, this was quickly disproven due to the absence of hair-like radial fractures surrounding the hole. Without any surrounding fractures, this type of wound could only be caused by a projectile traveling at extremely high speeds. Thus, a sensational theory was born. The wound in a 125,000 year old skull was caused by a bullet hole. This gave rise to implausible theories such as a time traveler going back in time and shooting the caveman, or past civilizations being much more advanced than previously thought, able to come up with a primitive model for a gun. In reality, there are countless more plausible explanations for this wound including that the wound had stemmed from a pathological lesion, to the wounds being caused by debris from natural disasters traveling at high speeds, such as tornadoes, volcanic eruptions, or an asteroid colliding with Earth. Numbers on esophagus A Redditor posted on r slash docs claiming that his friend had a scope after 15 years of acid reflux and found strange numbers on his esophagus. OP claimed that he had no previous procedures prior to this, and attached several photos of the inside of his friend's esophagus. The photos show numbers that look like they were written with ink on the inside of the esophagus. The doctor, while not being able to find an explanation, dismissed the numbers as they were not relevant to the case at hand.
Several Redditors had different theories about the origin of the numbers, with one claiming that a pill might have gotten stuck and the number on it imprinted on his esophagus. Another theory is that the ink from a medical chart or any other medical document might have gotten imprinted on the photo itself. Airship Angers This refers to Airship of Clown McNoise, a supernatural event that is reported in several historical documents that took place in the 740s in Ireland. The story evolved and changed through various retellings with the place, number of ships seen, and other details changing from account to account, but the general outline of the story remaining more or less the same. In the 740s, a ship was seen floating above Clown McNoise, a monastery in Ireland, when an anchor from the ship sailing in the sky got stuck on a church. In other accounts, the anchor is replaced by a fishing spear. One of the sailors on the ship then descended to get the anchor unstuck, swimming in the air below the ship and above the observers. When a priest down there sees the anchor and wouldn't let go, the sailor sent down to retrieve it protested that he was drowning, after which the priest releases the anchor and the sailor returns swimming to his ship, which then sails away. Explanations for this phenomenon are many. Some claim that people of the monastery simply saw a cloud that was oddly shaped like a boat, or other aberrant sky phenomena, with the other unusual events like the Kurun anchor getting stuck on the church being added in later retellings of the story. Another explanation is that this was an alien visitation with the ship being a UFO. A recent explanation is that what the townspeople saw was an ocean mirage, a phenomenon which can make ships at sea appear on the horizon. Fairy Blast Fairies are the good people or an integral part of Gaelic folklore, with many intricate ceremonies and rituals existing to keep their harm at bay and place them. Fairies were believed to have the ability to harm a human unseen, with many diseases being attributed to fairies, along with abductions or disappearances of children. There are three main ways fairies could harm humans. The first is the evil eye. The second is using a fairy shot or elf shot, which is categorized by a sudden sharp pain felt somewhere in the body, followed by a sudden sickness. The belief was that a fairy had launched a dart or arrow at the person to make them sick. The third method was using a fairy blast or the fairy wind. What exactly is the fairy blast and what it does actually differs across varying accounts, with people believing destructive forces like tornadoes or simple dust devils were caused by fairies either to destroy a structure in order to enter it, or to bring disease along with the wind. Other beliefs included fairy blasts being caused by fairies just passing beside a person, or a fairy breathing on the face of its intended target, causing momentarily or permanent blindness, or causing the victim to become sick and bedridden. In other more fringe accounts, the fairy blast causes a much stranger effect. In one account, a woman's servant started speaking in a different accent and displaying different mannerisms, one day with no warning. When questioned about the change in behavior by her employer, the servant claimed that she was struck by a fairy blast and had been turned into her dead sister Eileen. The servant then claimed that she would be herself again in a few days. Thus, a much rarer affliction of fairy blasts is that the person struck ceases to be themselves for a period and turns into a different person, usually a relative or a friend. S.S. Jasmine Landis. According to legend on the 1st of March 1882, the British ship S.S. Jasmine was on a voyage across the Atlantic. The ship departed from Messina, Sicily, planning to set off for New Orleans. Approximately 200 miles southwest of Madeira, the crew observed numerous dead fish around an area of 7,500 square miles, as well as muddied waters. Later that day, smoke was also observed. The following day, there were even more dead fish and thicker smoke, which seemed to have come from an island. The captain of the ship, Captain Robson, realized that the island may have emerged from the sea, since the charts and maps indicated that there should be no landmass there. Curious as to what the island was, Captain Robson took a landing party ashore to the island to explore. Following their exploration, they continued their voyage, ending their journey in New Orleans. Robson gave an account of his findings to a reporter from the newspaper Times Picayune. Robson described finding a variety of artifacts, including bronze swords, rings and mallets, carvings of heads and figures of birds and animals, and a mummy enclosed in a stone case. Robson also told the reporters that he intended on donating his findings to the British Museum. At the Times Picayune then printed a report of the story. However, there are many questions regarding the validity of the story. Since the island has not been seen since, the British Museum has no record of receiving any such collection, and the Times Picayune retracted their story. There is also no way of verifying the story, since the log of SS Jasmine along with the offices of the ship's owners was supposedly destroyed during the London Blitz in 1940. Thoughts Green Helmet 
A website called StopAbductions.com claims to be able to stop abductions of humans by aliens using something called a thought screen helmet. The website is run by Michael Melkin, who is also the inventor of the helmet. Michael claims that after working with abductees for 25 years and persons with neurological problems for 22 years, he believes that the thought screen helmet works by stimulating brain activity, stopping alien telepathy from being converted into human thoughts. According to Michael, the helmet has been effective in stopping abduction since 1999. He also says that aliens have stolen helmets from abductees but couldn't figure out how they work. According to Michael, only helmets made from Velostad work, which seems to be the key ingredient in shielding from telepathy. The site gives information on the materials needed, where to obtain them, how to assemble the helmet, as well as testimonies from people who have allegedly survived alien abductions after using the helmet. The site also gives details on aliens, things like their use of telepathy and how eventually there would be an all-out telepathic war, and how the Thought Screen Helmet is our only defense. There's another link titled Alien Weaknesses, which explains several of the Grey Aliens' weaknesses. One of the more outrageous ones is a report by a woman in 2008 who claimed that she had been implanted by alien fetuses and that she c***ed four of them by taking a gram of vitamin C every hour for weeks. She claims that she no longer felt the fetuses moving inside her. There doesn't seem to be much information on the creator of the helmet, Michael, other than what he's written about himself on the website. There's also an email where you can contact Michael directly. A luminous Woman of Pirano On the 8th of March 1934, Maria Gerade a patient in a hospital in Pirano, Istria, notices a strange light coming from the patient in the bed next to hers and proceeds to call a nurse. The nurse then proceeds to call other nurses and the head of the hospital, Dr. Domenico Sambo. Dr. Sambo was initially skeptical of the whole thing until he saw the patient for himself. The patient, 42-year-old Anna Monaro, is emitting a bright bluish light from her body. Anna, however, doesn't seem to be surprised attributing the phenomenon to some kind of divine intervention. Anna is an ordinary woman who is intensely religious. She had gone to the hospital to recover from a serious flare-up of her chronic asthma. Dr. Sambo gathers up a few of his colleagues to try to make sense of the phenomenon. Between the 9th to the 19th of March, they all witness the appearance of the blue light. Sometimes the light appears as a luminous globe over Anna's breasts, sometimes as a cone over her heart, and sometimes as a light beam shooting from her chest. The light can even be seen through the blankets and even while Anna sleeps, with the only thing out of the ordinary being that Anna's heart and breathing rate double, and she sweats profusely and groans during the experience. The doctors perform a variety of tests on Anna, but they all prove useless. The story then hits national news, attracting several research institutes who would like to perform tests on her. They also find nothing out of the ordinary. When interviewed, Anna claims that her body also glowed once when she was seven or eight. She also claims to be able to see spirits of the dead, as well as witness battles fought thousands of miles away, as if she was there. A psychiatric evaluation of Anna reveals that she's not insane. Her visions are not something uncommon among spiritual and religious people like her. When Anna recovers from the asthma flare-up, the glowing stops, never coming back again. A report of all the exams performed on Anna was published in an Italian medical magazine, with theories ranging from mitogenic radiation to electromagnetism, to bioluminescent bacteria. Other less scientific publications suggest a supernatural origin. However, the true reason for Anna's glow still remains a mystery. Wolves of Pavagata In 1983, a small town in Karnataka called Pavagata witnessed the gruesome death of 11 people over a two-year span, most of them being children. It started when a five-year-old girl was snatched away from her house past midnight. Following that, a three-year-old girl went missing a few days later. Both crime scenes showed paw prints but nothing else. In the following weeks, five other girls lost their lives with only skulls, limbs, or clothing left behind as the only way to identify them. Locals immediately attributed the case to be wolves and began hunting them. They also hunted hyenas causing the populations of both animals to drastically decrease and the attacks seemed to have ended. When another attack happened two months later, people started speculating other causes blaming black magic and sacrifices, since most of the victims happened to be little girls. Other locals began employing dogs to trace the scent left behind on the skull of one of the victims, which led them to a cave. However, nothing else was found. The cause of the attack still remains a mystery. Lake Okeechobee Skeletons In 1918, the water level in Lake Okeechobee in South Florida dropped to an all-time low, revealing hundreds of human skeletal remains of adults and children. 
The first theory was that the remains were victims of a hurricane in Okeechobee. However, it would have had to have been an ancient hurricane, since the 2,000 dead from the previous hurricanes were recovered and buried. Also, prior to 1900, barely any people lived near Lake Okeechobee. They couldn't have been casualties from storms or floods. Another theory is that the lake could have been used by a tribe as a burial site, since it could have been seen as a spiritual place. However, the remains were scattered randomly and with no artifacts accompanying them. There still doesn't seem to be an explanation for the origins of these remains. Stendek On the 2nd of August 1947, the British South American Airlines Avril Lancastrian known as Stardust went missing on a flight from Buenos Aires, Argentina to Santiago, Chile. Eleven people were on board the flight. Four minutes before Stardust's planned landing, the radio operator at Santiago Airport received this Morse code message. ETA Santiago 1745 hours. Stendek. The last word confused the operator, who then asked for clarification, to which the crew repeated the word Stendek two more times. Stardust never landed in Santiago and seemingly vanished for 50 years, its fate unknown. Until in 1998, a group of Argentine mountaineers climbing Mount Tupangado stumbled upon wreckage from the crash and several body parts of the passengers, which were confirmed by DNA testing. Investigators concluded that the crew mistakenly believed to be closer to Santiago than they already were while flying through a jet stream at high altitudes. Believing they had cleared the mountaintops, they started their descent and crashed into Mount Tupangado. The final message Stendek still remained a mystery with several theories put out as to what it meant. One popular theory is that the crew suffering from hypoxia mixed up the word descend into Stendek, which seems unlikely since the word was said three times in the exact order. Another theory is that Stendek was an acronym sent in a hurry, something to signify that they were going to crash. However, this theory is also disproven since the crew would encryptically abbreviate an important message and would instead use something like SOS. What seems the most likely is that the word may have been a mistake by the flight's crew, since Stendek doesn't have any meaning in any language, not even in Morse code. Miriam Bush Death In 1947 near Roswell, New Mexico, a U.S. Army Air Force's balloon crashed. After metallic and rubber debris was recovered by Roswell Army Airfield personnel, the U.S. Army announced that they were in possession of a flying disc, which made international headlines. However, the announcement was retracted within a day. This, along with the 1980s book The Roswell Incident, became the basis for many long-lasting UFO conspiracy theories, including the government hiding the existence of aliens, reverse engineering of alien technology, and alien corpses and autopsies. Miriam Bush was someone who knew exactly what happened in 1947. Bush was an executive secretary at the Roswell Army Airfield, meaning she would have seen the alleged alien bodies that were secretly brought to the base. Bush's immediate superior was Lieutenant Colonel Harold Warren, who played a significant role in the autopsies of the dead bodies used in the experiment. Bush was repeatedly told by high-ranking personnel at the base to never discuss what she had seen. Bush, however, secretly confided in her family, but warned them not to tell anyone. Following this, Bush became paranoid, entered into a loveless marriage and became an alcoholic as a result of being entangled in such an incident. Bush also felt that she was being constantly watched, and there were rumors that on two occasions, listening devices were placed on her home telephone. On December of 1989, Bush checked into a local motel in San Jose, California under her sister's name. The very next day, Bush was found dead in the motel room, with a plastic bag tied tightly around her neck. There were also marks on her arms which indicated some kind of fight. Despite evidence pointing to this being a murder, it was concluded that Bush took her own life. Whatever she knew regarding the Roswell incident, and what her specific role in it was, will always remain a mystery.